certainly appreciate all those songs, the congregations and the, uh, the ones that sang uh, separately. It does certainly, uh, it does certainly add something Amen. to the service and pray that it sets the tone, sets the mood and, and gets us in the attitude and the spirit that we should be in to hear from God's word. And, uh, I'm very thankful to be here, thankful for the invitation, very thankful for the Lafferty's and, and our friendship and getting to know their family over the last 15 years. Hard to believe it's been that long. I've known him since I was a kid. I'm still young, but I'm not as young as I used to be. Amen. Thank you for that. Well, there's no better way to introduce that, I guess. Let's just go ahead and turn to the text. Hosea, the book of Hosea, chapter 6. Verse number 1, Hosea, chapter 6, verse number 1. Come, and let us return unto the Lord. Amen. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he'll bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Amen. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord... His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain, unto the earth. Seems like they have at least a fairly decent grasp of what revival uh, should be. Mm -hmm. They seem to know that they were not where they should be with the Lord. They seem to know that it was their need to return to the Lord. The Lord never has to return to you. He, he's not the one that left. Right. The Lord's not the one that's left his people. So it looks like at least they realize their great need was revival. And as they considered their need for it, there were some uh, specific areas that they were encountered with that they were going to need to work on. And I hope tonight as we look through uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7 of Hosea, uh, that there are several lessons that we can learn uh, about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we'd be willing tonight to, if I would be willing to do some true and real examination just of myself, I would see that there are some areas that I've got to, I've got to do better at, that I've got to work on. This passage here in this context, he's going to give them at least five analogies. Five things Israel is going to be compared to in this conversation of revival. Five conditions that need to be revived. Let's Amen. pray. Father, we're thankful to come tonight. We're thankful for the, the music, the songs, uh, those that have already prayed. And I just ask that you would take... Uh, this hour, take this time as we focus on your word. Help us to not only grow, but Lord, help us to see our great need uh, of getting getting in a good spot, getting back on track, getting whatever uh, cliche it is that we need for the hour. Uh, help us to see our great need to, to stand before you right and faithful. And Lord, for where we've gotten off and where we've departed, that you'd give us the courage and the grace to, uh, to confess, to make it right, and to just to be as faithful yes, as we know how to be. Forgive us of our sins. Uh, Lord, help us. Help us to be the servants that we ought to be. Help us in these days, with whatever time we have left in this world, to be faithful about your business. And Lord, help us to learn tonight um, some things that we might need to correct to yes, truly Lord. see revival. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Five conditions we'll give tonight. Five conditions that need revived. Hosea chapter 6, verse number 4, the Bible says, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. Mm. Number one, the morning cloud. Number one, the morning cloud. What is a morning cloud? Well, something that's here one minute and gone the next. Right. Amen. It doesn't stay. It doesn't last. And that's how Israel's goodness, that's what he says there in verse number four, your goodness is as a morning cloud. The Lord looks at their goodness and it says uh, that it has no staying power. Now, imagine the gall of Brother Lafferty calling me to, uh, to come and to, and to preach this week of services. And Brother Lafferty calls me and he says, you know, Brother Philip, we, we want to have a week of services. Uh, we're praying about it. We're truly seeking revival. 
And my answer to him was, I don't believe you. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if someone during the invitation came forward and they said, Brother Lafferty, you know, you've preached or someone else has preached and, and, and you know, the Lord's really spoke to me. I, I want, there's some things that I want to make right. There's some things I need to correct. I, there, there's some things I know I could do better at. And Lord, I, I want to be more faithful. And, and in that quietness, Brother Lafferty whispers in your ear, I don't believe you. <laughs> you say, wow. That, that, that takes a lot of gall, right? That's, that's exactly what God said to Israel. Yep. Amen. Uh -huh. Hear what they're saying? Come, let's return to the Lord. Let's get back to the Lord. Let's go and return. He'll revive us. And we're going to follow on to know the Lord. And we're going to start doing right. And we're going to be faithful. And, and everything's going to work out just fine. Things are going to be the way they used to be. And, and we're just going to get back to the Lord. <laughs> oh, Israel. Just like a morning cloud. Right. Yeah. He looks at him and it's like the Lord saying, I don't believe you. Mm -hmm. This is something I just, it's here one minute and it'll be gone the next. But why doesn't the Lord seem to believe them? Why does the Lord use language that's almost insulting to them? And it's because they have yet to show any manner You're right. of consistency. <laughs> Amen. You know, the book of Hosea was written during the reign of Jeroboam II. Turn back to 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. We'll set the scene here just a little bit before Jeroboam II became king. There's a scene here where Jehoahaz was king over Israel. 2 Kings chapter 13. Let's pick up a verse 1. 2 Kings 13 and verse 1. In the three and twentieth year of Joash, son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, and he reigned seventeen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria and into the hand of Benhadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. And Jehoahaz besought the Lord. And the Lord hearkened unto him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. And the Lord gave Israel a savior, so that they went out from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin, but walked therein, and there remained the grove also in Samaria. Mm. This is what the Lord's talking about. You're right. Here one minute and gone the next. It talks about Jehoahaz. It talks about who, who he was as a king. It talks about the status of the nation at the time. And things were bad and no one seemed like they were serving the Lord or following the Lord. At least certainly not the majority. And the Lord sent Hazael and he sent Ben-Hadad, these kings of Syria, and conquered the nation of Israel and took some of them captive at times and, and just was oppressive. And what does it say there? It says that they besought the Lord. Jehovah has besought the Lord. And the Lord sent a Savior. And then how long did it take him to go right back? Right. And this is why, just as you come to the book of Hosea, you're just two kings later, and they say, well, we, we want to return to the Lord. We want to be more faithful. We want the Lord to revive us. And the Lord says, mm -hmm. here one minute, gone the next. Now, that was a common occurrence in Israel. They were so wishy-washy that when they speak of revival, the Bible paints language like the Lord doesn't even believe them. Mm -hmm. And that, that, ought to, that ought to get deep. Should have got deep to them. That now when they cry it out, the Lord doesn't even take them seriously. And doesn't even seem like he believes them. Now listen, if I'm not careful, I'm going to find myself caught in the same rut. Amen. Yeah. Struggling Amen. with consistency. Struggling with being stable and solid. And that's what we don't want. We don't want our spiritual life. We don't want our relationship with the Lord to be something like that. It's considered right. here one minute and gone right. the next. Amen. You know, I have... Uh, Kind of a joke that I have with everybody at work, and they'll probably give it to me next week since I've been off this week. But anybody goes on vacation, anybody takes a day off, anybody calls in sick, they come in the next day, and I always look at them and say, Hey, part timer. <laughs> I wonder if sometimes when I come to the Lord seeking Him, maybe He couldn't look at me and say, Hey, welcome back, part timer. Yeah. 
The morning cloud. My goal as a Christian ought to be to establish consistent patterns of faithfulness. Amen. We're not just supposed to pray when, when things are bad. We're not just supposed to read our Bible when uh, we can fit it into our schedule. We're, we're not supposed to be, you know, our spiritual life isn't supposed to be something that we make time for. It ought to be part of us. It ought to be part of our character. It ought to be part, I mean, just a daily walk with the Lord as Christians. That it seems like, that seems so basic. It seems so fundamental. It seems like this is, you know, scratching the bottom of the barrel here. But the Lord says, you know, you have yet to really, you know, really establish any pattern of consistency. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just anytime you say anything good, anytime that you say anything right, it's like it's just like here one minute and gone the next. Mm -hmm. No consistency. And that's what I want. I want to develop a consistent pattern of faithfulness. Uh, you know, I don't want to be someone that is considered flighty and not reliable and not stable and doesn't have a pattern of consistency. Now, you may be here tonight and you, you prayed about these services and we all seek, we all want revival. Could we be honest that this may be one of the first one of the first conditions we might need to address in ourselves? Amen. Amen. Is that Amen. we're just not very consistent. Mm -hmm. We're just not very consistent. We don't have consistent patterns of faithfulness. Yeah, we're here all the time. We know all the right things to do and all the right things to say, but I'm talking about a daily relationship with the Lord just not being very consistent. They say we want revival. The Lord says that's the first thing we got to address. Amen. You, you just this doesn't seem very reliable. It seems like I've heard this before. A morning cloud. Turn back to Hosea in our text. Hosea, and now let's go over to chapter seven. Hosea chapter 7 and verse number 8. Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Number 2, the cake not turned. Hmm. The morning cloud speaks to their lack of consistency. So how about this analogy? A cake not turned. Cooked on one side. In other words, not cooked all the way through. The surface is seared. Israel was so superficial. Right. Anyone who's ever cooked, and I don't do a lot of it, but even I know that something can look cooked on the outside right. and be nasty on the inside. Mm -hmm. Still be raw. Still be unedible. Looks good. Looks the part. Looks like it's been cooked. But it's mush inside. Mm -hmm. It's not done. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter number 12. Is that you tonight? Uh, you know, like I said, these, these things, we, we're just going to be honest. You know? Right. This, just, this takes an honest assessment of who we are, where we're at, where we stand. These things aren't deep. These aren't, you know, wonderful thoughts. It's just a real evaluation of, you know what, if I really want revival, there's some basics that i got to address. One of them being consistency. Another one being the fact that, you know, a lot of times, things may look good to you on the outside. And inside, it ain't there. Right. It's mush inside. We all know how to play the part with each other. Mm -hmm. we, we've all played this game long enough yeah. to know how to impress each other. Uh, we know what to say. We know right. how to shake hands. We know how to smile. We, we know all of the things. Mm. We, we, can all, we can all come here tonight and, and never let on. The, 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 there's something inside that's just not right. Mm -hmm. We know we're not where we ought to be with the Lord. We know that while everything looks good on, on the outside, it, we're a cape not turned. Mm -hmm. It's superficial. It's all on the outside. It's all a display. It's all an act. It's all a game. We're not. A, none of us are above doing that. We've all done right. it. Right. Every one of us has come to church not in the mood. Every one of us has come to church, uh, you know, begrudgingly, you know, and, and come just so that you won't bother me this week and call and say, hey, where you been? Matthew chapter 12. In verse 43, it says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. 
And then he saith, I'll return into my house from whence I came out. And when he's come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Right. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Amen. Even so shall it be also to this wicked generation. Now here's a guy that to you on the outside looks the part. Right? He looks the part. And here this devil or this spirit, this evil spirit that had been there has left and he comes back and you know what he finds? This guy's got it cleaned up. This guy's been swept out. He's been garnished. Everything looks great. Here's the problem. Nobody lives there. No ownership. Now we know as children of God by faith in Christ Jesus that that's not us. We have a resident. Okay? We've got somebody that's taking up space. We've got someone Amen. that lives in us, lives within us. But listen, we're still not above at times looking the part on the outside Amen. and not having it on the inside. Now listen, in just real honesty, there are many times that I've just played the part and tried to impress people. I don't want you to know that there's anything wrong. I don't want to let down defenses. I don't want to let down my guard. And so I come and sing and sometimes I preach and right. fellowship and eat with everybody and, and I go home and I'm nowhere near where I ought to be any more than when I walked in the house. Right. It's real and it happens to us. Yeah. Amen. If we want revival, that's something that's going to have to be addressed. As it's going to have to get beyond the outside. Okay, it's going to have to be something. We're just going to have to not be cooked on one side. We're going to have to be cooked all the way through. Amen. There's got to be a time when it's not just things that we're doing. It's going to be a time when our relationship with Christ, when our relationship with the Lord is real and it goes beyond something that you can see and with these hands and things that I'm doing with my hands and my feet. It goes beyond what you hear coming out of this mouth, whether it be in a preached sermon, whether it be in a song that's being sung. There's going to have to be a time when it's real in the quiet of the night, when there's nobody around to be impressed, that I've got something real. That there's a real relationship with Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. That when I pray, I'm actually making it through and not bouncing prayers off the ceiling because I'm not right, because I'm not living for Christ, and I'm not doing those things that I know in my heart that I'm supposed to do. It, 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 it doesn't it get old? Doesn't it get tiresome? Right. And it just gets old living this life where all we're doing is trying to make sure everybody else thinks everything's okay. Right. Amen. Why don't we just admit it? You know, you don't right. have to admit it to me. I understand. I'm a guest preacher. You know, you don't answer to me anyway. You don't have to convince me or impress me with anything. Right. But could you just truly tonight be honest and be honest before the Lord and say, you know what? I've been playing. I've been playing the game a long time, and maybe I've gotten so good at it that I don't even realize it's a game anymore. Right. I don't even realize I'm not real. I'm so superficial. Everything's fake. Everything's fake on the outside. And tonight be a night where you just get real with God. Amen. You come before the Lord. You don't have to come to me. You be, but you get before the Lord, and you say, this stuff ain't cooked all the way through. Right. I am mush on the inside. In the book of Hosea, chapter 6, he tells them, let's go back there, Hosea, chapter 6, and in verse 6, he wants more of them than he has. He wants more than just deeds. And in Hosea 6, in verse 6, he says, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. There comes a time when he, the Lord says, I want more of you than I have. Amen. I want more of you than just the things that you're doing. Than just the sacrifices. Than just the burnt offerings. What about the knowledge of God? Amen. How long has it been since we, we felt like we knew God? We were close. We know about God. How long has it been since we really knew the Lord? In a close walk, in a close relationship. Yeah. Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Does the Lord have my heart? Does he have your heart tonight? Or does he just have you on the surface? Could you be a cake not turned? Number three, Hosea chapter seven. 
in verse number 9. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, great hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. Number three, gray hairs. Gray hairs. I'll try to be careful. <laughs> yeah. Be careful. <laughs> What's the analogy here? How did gray hairs get there? <clears throat> Gradually. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Nobody wakes up one morning to a head full of gray hairs. It's part of the process. It's part of the aging. Now, I don't get very many grays, but I do have a halo on top. <laughs> we are prone to this. Where one day, we wake up, and the processes of life have taken over, and we have a, gray, a head full of gray hairs. Mm-hmm. And that's how this world works. Strangers have devoured his strength. And he knoweth it not. Have you ever read about some of the great men of the Bible and how they fell? Yeah. And usually it's gradually, right? Mm -hmm. David can go from being a giant killer to an adulterer. Mm -hmm. Gradually. <laughs> Peter could go from saying, though all men be offended of thee, I'll never be offended. I think he looked right at some of the other disciples. Some of these guys might be offended by you. I never will. And then 40-some verses later in Matthew 26, he said, I don't know him. Right. I don't know him. This world is a great devourer of our strength. Amen. You know, Samson flirted and flirted and flirted, and he literally woke up one morning with no strength left. You would think that there's no possible way to get a head full of gray hairs and not know it. But it's exactly what it says about Israel. It says there, strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yet gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. His life... Their attitudes, their actions, their lifestyle, their character, all of those things just went on and on and on. And never taking a moment to realize and never taking some time to think about it. And then, you know, you look in the, you look in the mirror and, it's, and he's got a head full of gray hairs. Mm -hmm. Now that didn't happen overnight. It did not happen in one night. It did not happen in one year. But listen, we're not, we're prone to that. We're not above that happening to us as believers right. of, of getting away from where we ought to be and not being the people that we ought to be and not having the character and the integrity that we ought to and actually staying there for a little while. You know, I would like to think that as soon as I walk away, that I get right and get right back. I tell you what, there are a lot of times, if we be honest, it takes us a long time to come back. Amen, you're right. And get right and get to where we ought to be. And a lot of times it's when we wake up one morning and we realize we got no strength at all. Mm -hmm. And I realize I'm in way over my head. And I've got now I've got a real battle that I'm trying to fight. I got no strength and no ability to do it. Some days are bigger than others. Some days are harder than others. There are days I feel very confident. I feel very capable and able to get through and fight some certain battles. But I tell you what, it won't be long till there's a day and there's a battle that you're going to need some help and some strength. And Israel woke up and they had no. Right. The strangers had devoured it. This world will wear on you. This world wears on us and slowly eats away at our strength. Right. You can't get away for very long. You've got to stay close. Amen. You have to remain close to the Lord, faithful and seeking Him and serving and fighting and all of those things. Amen. Amen. Strangers have devoured His strength and knoweth it not. Samson had no clue till he had no strength to get out of those next battles. Gray hairs are here and there, and he doesn't know it. I don't want to get used to it. 
I don't want to get used to this world. I don't want to get used to being away. I don't want to get used to what I have been used to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to wake up one morning and not have any strength. Let's hurry on. Hosea chapter 7, look at verse 11. <coughs> Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. Number four, the silly dove. What, what is a silly dove? No heart. It's just floating around. It's just flying around. It's just hanging around. Every now and then it'll find some place to land. Every now and then it's just, it's just flying. It has no ultimate destination. It has no ultimate purpose. It has no ultimate motive. Uh, it's just flying around. Mm -hmm. Now the truth is this, one of the tragedies in our life, and one of the tragedies in America is that we've ra already raised one generation, and now we're on the second, that has no goals, right. no ambition, Amen. no purpose, nothing to live for, nothing to serve for, uh, you know, just hanging out, mm -hmm. flying around, a silly dove, and they'll go to Egypt, and they'll call to Assyria, but, but they're just, we're just flying around. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of times as Christians, we look at our lives, and if we were honest with ourselves, we, we talk about the Lord's coming, and we talk about wanting to be ready for that, but I think a lot of times we're kind of just hanging out, mm -hmm. waiting for it. Yep. We don't really have a motive. We don't really have goals. We don't really have an ambition. You know, Brother Larry mentioned Esther last night, you know, and, and how when she went in and spoke to the king, and how Mordecai had come to her and say, you know, what if you were called to the kingdom for such a time as this? Amen. You know, something, a purpose. You know, you, you can actually see it. It's actually written on paper what her purpose was, what her calling was to do. You know, we can look at ourselves, and I got to admit, and Mandy's going to laugh as soon as I say this. Um, I like a lazy day every now and then. Okay. Maybe you've had a long week at work, things are rough, things are hard, and you know what, Saturday, I'm just going to have a lazy day. I'm not going to do anything. There's nothing wrong with that. At least I don't think so. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with having a lazy day. But you know you, and I know me. Don't lazy days become lazy weeks? Yep. Don't lazy weeks become lazy months? And lazy months become... When is the last time I actually did something for the Lord? When is the last time I did something that's going to matter in the next life? Right. Amen. Beyond this world. Beyond the cares, the troubles, and the things of this world. When's the last time that I did something that's going to matter in the next life? And all of a sudden... Those lazy days that I'm okay with, <laughs> I'm finding I've lived a lazy life that I'm regretful for. And David looked at all those that wouldn't fight and said, is there not a cause? Why are you mad at me? You know, why are you mad at me? You, you know, someone that comes in and they want to fight and they are gung ho and they're ready and they're excited and they want to do something. And, and then everybody turns against him and everybody looks at David and they kind of laugh at him. He's like, now, did anybody here have a purpose? Doesn't anybody here have a calling? Doesn't anyone here have any motives, ambitions, or goals? This guy's insulting the Lord. This guy is just, just rebuking and, and just being a nuisance, disrespecting the God of our fathers. Mm -hmm. Do we not have a goal? Often it's been said that uh, you know, youth is wasted on the young. What's that mean? It means that oftentimes people don't even realize their purpose. Or they're calling until it's too late to do anything about it. As people grow, as they mature, and they begin to see all that needs to be done, unfortunately, they don't have the youthful strength anymore to do it. Right. Are we flying around? 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, I don't know if you have any goals or have any motives have any drive or any ambition, but here's some for you, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 8, it says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. 
Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, the Lord, but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you made, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might Amen. receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Amen. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this self same thing. That ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. You want a motive? Pick one. Amen. Pick one. P pick a reason to get involved. Carefulness. You know, because, because you care. How about... Um, clearing of yourselves. How about for your own conscience sake? Amen. How about for the clearing of your own mind and your own conscience? What indignation. He says there, yay, what revenge. How about you get involved because you're upset? Because you're mad? Don't you remember the life that, that we wasted when we were lost? Don't you remember how the devil has tried to, 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 to torture and to destroy your life even after you've been saved? How about revenge? Amen. Pick one. If you've got trouble getting motivated to do something, here's a whole list of here's Amen. a whole list of purposes, goals, and motives. Pick Amen. one. Just pick one. But do something. Get involved. Do something Amen. for the Lord. Don't you get over, don't you fly around? Ephraim's like a silly dove. It's like they have no place to land. It's like they got no place to go. No motive, no goal, no ambition, no purpose. Right. We know we, we we got a list to pick from. Yeah. Just get involved. Find a reason to serve and to get involved. The silly dove. Hosea chapter 7. Hosea chapter 7 verse 16. They return, but not to the Most High. He's ready to close this discussion that opened in chapter 6. When they said, let us return, the Lord says in verse 16 of chapter 7, they return, but not to the Most High. They're like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Number five, the fifth condition, a deceitful bow. A deceitful bow. What is that? Well, ultimately, it's a bow that's unusable. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that as much. Some people still do, but you might be more familiar with using a gun. And you go out there and you go hunting. What good's a gun going to do you if the sights aren't true? Mm -hmm. That's what he means. A deceitful bow. Mm -hmm. it, this one won't shoot straight. It's not dependable. It's not reliable. It's not going to get the job done. And the Lord ends the conversation the same way that he began. He says, they return, but, but not to me. It's like, he's, it's just like he doesn't believe. He says, they're a deceitful bow. They're not reliable. They're not trustworthy. They're not dependable. And that may be the condition tonight that you see. Mm -hmm. Have you been dependable to the Lord? Have you been dependable on the Lord's service? Are you trustworthy? Are you reliable? You know, that's one of my great fears at work. I have, I have a job, I work in an office, and my great fear at work is that those I work with would see me as unreliable and undependable. I wish that I had that same attitude toward my church, toward the Lord, that the Lord would see, that the Lord wouldn't see me as unreliable and undependable. Have you ever noticed that it's always the same people that have stories. It's always the same people over and over and over again that it looks like the Lord's using. And they always have a story to tell. And they've always been somewhere. And they've always done something. It's the same people all the time. And you wonder, well, why is that? How is that? You know why? The same reason why when you go to the shelf or when you go to the toolbox, you grab the same tool. And you grab the same screwdriver. And you grab the same. Right. Because you know this tool has a proven record that it gets the job done. Yeah. 
And the Lord says, they're a deceitful bow. Israel's not dependable. Israel's not reliable. And listen, I don't want to be the guy that when it comes time for the Lord to do something in this world and for the Lord to do a work, and he looks at me and says, you know what? I'm not sure he's going to get the job done. He passes me along and he gives the job to someone else. Mm -hmm. I want my Lord to find me reliable, Amen. dependable, and trustworthy. I want to do things. I want to come through. I want to finish the job. Amen. I want to be someone that's reliable mm. and that you can commit things to and that I'll come through. Amen. So tonight, just an honest assessment. We want revival. You said you've prayed for these services. We've prayed in advance of coming. We're just like ch chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Where we want to return to the Lord. We want to follow on to know the Lord. And so he encounters them with five things. The morning cloud. Maybe you realize tonight that it's consistency that you've been struggling with. And you've got to develop some better patterns of faithfulness and consistency. And maybe it's a cake not turn. Maybe you realize, you know what, the, it's in here. The problem is me. The problem is not that, you know, I haven't been doing things. The problem is that it's not, it's not been real in here for a long time. Hmm. Maybe you've found that you've got some gray hair spiritually. And you, you've gone a while. And you're starting to lose your strength. Hmm. You haven't noticed it yet. But maybe tonight some self-examination will reveal it. Maybe you're a silly dove, and it's just been a while since you've done anything. No motives, no goals, no purpose, no ambition, and you need to get involved, and you need to serve, and you need to be more faithful. Or maybe tonight an honest assessment would say, Brother Philip, you're right, I'm just not very reliable. I've not been very dependable. I'm not sure right now that the Lord could trust me to do anything. If you'll make an honest assessment and get some of those things right with the Lord tonight, revival is not an impossibility. It's not impossible right. to return to the Lord. It's not impossible to follow on to know the Lord. But the Lord will look at Israel and say, I'm not sure I believe you. You got some of these things you've got to get right. You got some of these things that got to be addressed. And that may be the way for New Testament Baptist Church this week. I don't know. I don't know any of your homes. I don't know anything about what's going on in your life. But if you want revival, the Lord might look and say, all right, here's five things. Mm -hmm. Take a look. Maybe more than one thing for you. Maybe it's not just one of the five. It could be any number. Could you take a look tonight?